Please turn with me this evening to Genesis chapter 13. We are considering the entire chapter this evening. So Abram went up from Egypt to the Negev, he and his wife and all that belonged to him, and Lot with him. Now Abraham, Abram was very rich in livestock, in silver and in gold. He went on his journeys from the Negev as far as Bethel to the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Ai, to the place of the altar which he had made there formerly. And there Abram called on the name of the Lord. Now Lot, who went with Abram, also had flocks and herds and tents, and the land could not sustain them while dwelling together, for their possessions were so great that they were not able to remain together. And there was strife between the herdsmen of Abr Abram's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock. Now the Canaanite and the Perizzite were dwelling then in the land. So Abram said to Lot, Please let there be no strife between you and me, nor between my herdsmen and your herdsmen, for we are brothers. Is not the whole land before you? Please separate from me. If to the left, then I will go to the right, or if to the right, then I will go to the left. Lot lifted up his eyes and saw all the valley of the Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere, this was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as you go to Zoar. So Lot chose for himself all the valley of the Jordan, and Lot journeyed eastward. Thus they separated from each other. Abram settled in the land of Canaan, while Lot settled in the cities of the valley, and moved his tents as far as Sodom. Now the men of Sodom were wicked exceedingly and sinners against the Lord. The Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, Now lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are, northward and southward and eastward and westward. For all the land which you see I will give to you and to your descendants forever. I will make your descendants as the dust of the earth, so that if anyone can number the dust of the earth, then your descendants can also be numbered. Arise, walk about the land through its length and breadth, for I will give it to you. Then Abram moved his tent and came to dwell by the oaks of Mamre, which are in Hebron, and there he built an altar to the Lord. Let's pray and ask God's blessing. Lord, we come to you tonight asking your blessing upon your word. Lord, by your spirit, teach us and guide us, lead us and direct us. For we pray in Jesus' name, amen. This evening I'm going to do something that I have never done before. I'm going to declaim a sermon. Declamation is when you preach another preacher's sermon with proper attribution. I once heard a man preach a very wonderful sermon. He was hoping to become the pastor of the church where he was preaching, and everyone was very impressed that night with his sermon. Well, that all ended when one of the elders mentioned that he had heard R.C. Sproul preach that exact same sermon. Now, if this man had mentioned that it was Sproul's sermon, there would have been no cause for concern. But since he failed to attribute the sermon to its true source, he was no longer considered as a candidate for that pulpit. So this evening I am declaiming a sermon that was originally written and preached by Arthur Franklin Perkins. During our recent time in Brazil, I spent a lot of time studying Arthur Perkins' sermons. And the sermon that I'm going to preach to you tonight is one of his most impressive efforts, in my opinion. 
Now let me be clear at the outset that I am not going to be preaching about Arthur Perkins. I'm not even preaching about Arthur Perkins' sermon. I'm preaching the Word of God, and I am following the sermon outline that Arthur Perkins wrote and used. This particular sermon was preached by Perkins on numerous occasions in various churches. His records show that he first preached this sermon in Robinson, Wisconsin on November 9, 1928. So here is Abraham and Lot contrasted with appreciation to Reverend Arthur Perkins. The way men act and the choice they make in a crisis usually shows forth their character and determines their career. So the way men act, their deeds, their actions, the pattern of their conduct, and the choices that they make in a time of crisis typically reveal their character and they do much to determine their future career. And so those choices made in times of crisis are absolutely crucial. They show us what kind of people we're dealing with, and they set a person on a trajectory. This is clearly true from Genesis 13 for both Abraham and Lot, but it is true for us too. We need to think about the pattern of our conduct, the way we act. We need to focus on the choices that are presented to us in times of crisis because these things do reveal the character that we have and they will determine much of our future careers. So as we look at this passage tonight, I want to first start with the likeness of the two. Then we're going to see the crisis that faced them. We're going to examine the choices that they made. Then we will look at their respective careers and finish with the result of the choices. These two men, Abraham and Lot, were very much alike. They came from the same environment. This fact is established early in Genesis. Genesis chapter 11, if you look at verse 31, you can see their shared environment. Terah took Abram his son and Lot the son of Haran, his grandson, and Sarai his daughter-in-law, his son Abram's wife. And they went out together from Ur of the Chaldeans in order to enter the land of Canaan. And they went as far as Haran and settled there. The days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. So here we have this small collection of people. We have Terah, the father. We have Abram, his son. We have Lot, his grandson. And then we have Sarai, who is the wife of Abram. And this little family set out from Ur of the Chaldeans. They had lived beyond the Euphrates River. God had called them to leave. He was going to bring them to Canaan. And so they set out as a group, and they move. And they go as far as Haran, and they stop there. Terah, the father, died there in Haran, and then Abram, Lot, and Sarai continue on their way to Canaan. So they come from the same background, the same environment, the same family setting, the same upbringing. It's very popular to look back at people and say, you know, the choices they made were determined by their environment. So the reason that they made different choices is because they had different environments. But that's not the case with Abraham and Lot. They come from the very same setting, the same situation. There's another point on this that we find in Joshua chapter 24. 
So turn to Joshua 24, verse 2. Joshua said to all the people, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, From ancient times your fathers lived beyond the river, namely Terah, the father of Abraham, and the father of Nahor, and they served other gods. So the environment that Abraham was born and raised in that Sarai was born and raised in, that Lot was born and raised in, was an atmosphere of idolatry. They were not serving the one true and living God. They were serving idols. They were idolaters during that time that they lived beyond the river. So it's not just that they came from the same environment. They came from the same pagan environment. And you can't look at Abraham and say, oh, Abraham was so faithful, but Lot was a disappointment because they had different religious upbringings. No, they didn't. They were both rooted and raised in idolatry. And so their environment was exactly the same. That's one way in which they are alike. Another, more important way that they are alike is that both of these men were justified justified freely by God's grace. Justification is an act of God's free grace whereby he pardons the sinner of his sin, forgives him, but then also grants him the righteousness which is imputed to him and received by faith alone. Both Lot and Abraham are justified men. Now this would come as no surprise concerning Abraham because of Genesis 15, verse 6. If you turn there, very familiar words. Then he, Abraham, believed in the Lord and he reckoned it to him as righteousness. Now this is the verse that Paul picks up on in Romans and elsewhere to argue the whole doctrine of justification by faith alone. Abraham believed the Lord and the Lord credited it to him as righteousness. Abraham is clearly a justified man. No question about that. But what about Lot? As we think of Lot, we don't necessarily think of him as a believer, as a justified man. But Lot was justified. If we turn to 2 Peter chapter 2, we find proof of that fact. Second Peter 2, verses 7 and 8. And if he, that is the Lord, rescued righteous Lot, oppressed by the sensual conduct of unprincipled men, for by what he saw and heard, that righteous man, while living among them, felt his righteous soul tormented day after day by their lawless deeds, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from temptation and to keep the unrighteous under punishment for the day of judgment. Now, three times in two verses, Lot is called righteous. He is righteous Lot in verse 7. He is a righteous man in verse 8. And he has a righteous soul that is tormented by the vile deeds of the men of Sodom and Gomorrah. Now the term there in Greek for righteous is the typical normal term for righteousness and justification. This is not a descriptive statement where it is saying, well, Lot made some righteous choices, so let's consider him a righteous man because he made right choices. That's not the point. In fact, we know that Lot made some very foolish choices some very unrighteous choices. Just moving into Sodom was not a really wise thing to do. It's not talking about 
the quality of his choices. It's talking about his spiritual status. That Lot was a righteous man with a righteous soul because he had been justified freely by God's grace. So as we think about these two men, Abraham and Lot, we're not thinking about a believer and an unbeliever, a regenerate man and an unregenerate man, a faithful man and a godless man. We're not thinking about difference. We're thinking about two believers. And so this text is really not about the salvation of Lot. It's about the whole topic of sanctification and Lot's choices as a justified, righteous man. So these two men, Abraham and Lot, the same in their upbringing, background, and environment, the same in their spiritual state. They are both justified. That leads us then in Genesis 13 to the crisis. And the crisis comes upon them in part because of God's providential blessings upon both of these men. Abraham and Lot were both farmers, both agricultural men. They had flocks and herds. And as they raised their flocks and herds, God granted them much prosperity and success. Their flocks and their herds grew and expanded so that they had much material blessing. In fact, it became such a great blessing that the two men could not live together in the same area because of the largeness of their agricultural operations. And so the point comes where their possessions were so great that they were not able to remain together. Now this causes some friction because the herdsmen of Lot are understandably committed to their employer and they want the best for Lot's flocks and herds, the best water, the best pasture. But Abraham's herdsmen want the same for their master's flocks and herds. They too want the best water, the choice pasture. And so the herdsmen begin running up against each other. They begin conflicting. There is stress and tension and hostility. There's an unhealthy competition. And what makes this even worse is the fact that the Canaanite and the Perizzite were living in the land at that time. So here you have the employees of two believers that are in conflict with each other, and they are in conflict in front of unbelievers. And don't think that unbelievers won't pick up on this and use it as ammunition against the Lord and against the gospel. This is why Paul tells the Corinthians that when they have disputes against each other, they should not go to court in front of unbelievers. Because to do so will bring the name of Christ into disrepute. And so, settle your differences in-house, Paul says to the Corinthians, but don't drag Christ into the public courts before unbelieving judges. And so, this crisis is heightened by the fact that there are unbelievers watching everything that's going on. It seems that there was even the possibility that this strife between the herdsmen could damage the relationship between Uncle Abraham and his nephew Lot. And Abraham begins to realize this. He says, please, let there be no strife between you and me, nor between my herdsmen and your herdsmen, for we are brothers. Lot values this connection not only because of their physical connection as family members, but because of their spiritual connection. They are spiritual brothers and not just physical relatives. And so Abraham realizes a change needs to come about. We're going to have to go our separate ways. 
And this is the crisis, really. It's time to choose to go different directions so that Lot's agricultural pursuits can prosper, and so can Abram's. And so Abram does something which is truly a gentleman's move. He gives Lot the first choice. He says, you choose. And wherever you decide, I'll go the other place. Now Abraham had every right to take that first choice for himself. He's the older man. He's the more mature man. He's the uncle. And it's Lot's job to submit to his uncle, not vice versa. But Abram takes the road of humility, and he says, no, you choose first. And in doing this, he is being very gracious and very generous. Well, as we think about the choices that they make, we see that Abram is on the move all the time. And as he hears Lot's decision, he removes his tent and he comes and he dwells at Mamre, which is Hebron, and there he built an altar to the Lord. So he is going in the direction opposite where Lot is choosing. But as we think about the choices that Abram makes, we have to realize that there are spiritual connections in his choices as well. We see this in Hebrews chapter 10, chapter 11. So turn to Hebrews 11, verse 10. And this is very descriptive of Abram's whole life, including this particular incident. Hebrews 11, starting at verse 9. By faith he lived as an alien in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, fellow heirs of the same promise. For he was looking for the city which has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. So as Abraham looks at this situation, he is not si simply thinking, what's the best agricultural option open to me? He has a deeper desire, a higher purpose. He is looking for the city which has foundations. The city whose architect and builder is God. He is searching for that heavenly city, that holy place. And this is because Abraham's choices are driven and motivated and informed by his faith. But as we look back again at Genesis 13, we see that Lot's choice was not so wise. Lot chose for the present advantage. Look in verses 10 through 12 of Genesis 13. Lot lifted his eyes and saw all the valley of the Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as you go to Zoar. So Lot chose for himself all the valley of the Jordan, and Lot journeyed eastward. Thus they separated from each other. Abram settled in the land of Canaan, while Lot settled in the cities of the valley and moved his tents as far as Sodom. He is thinking and looking for the best immediate result from his choice. He wants the area that is well watered, that is most suited for livestock. And as he looks, he is not thinking at all about the spiritual ramifications of his choice. Really for Lot, it was a very significant time of leaving the godly influence of his uncle Abraham and going out on his own and dwelling near the men of Sodom and Gomorrah. Well, these choices then determine their careers. And as we think about the career of Lot, 
we see that he settled down among sinners in a fruitful land. Yes, he had the best agricultural option available, but he is also living near to the city of Sodom, a city that was filled to overflowing with vile pagan people. And he is making a choice to trade off spiritual benefit for his own material advantage. As Lot lived there in the valley of the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, Lot soon found briars. In Genesis 14, we read about the coming of Cator Leomar and the kings of the east. They came over the fertile crescent and they came rampaging through Canaan. And these people were destroying all opposition. Cater Leomer and his allies conquered everything in their path. And when they got to Sodom, they took Sodom. They gathered all the goods of Sodom, including Lot and his household and his goods. And they carted him off. And so that choice to live near Sodom in the lush valley of the cities actually came back to bite Lot. But Lot was not forgotten of God. Indeed, after he was returned to Sodom, and as he lived there in Sodom, God still did not forget him. We see in Genesis 19 that when God was preparing to bring destruction on that wicked city, he sent his angels to speak to Lot and to rescue Lot. Matthew Henry says in his commentary, those who are choosing relations, callings, dwellings, or settlements are guided and governed by the lust of the flesh, the lusts of the eye, or the pride of life, and consult not the interest of their souls, cannot expect God's blessing upon them. And that is so true of Lot as he made his choice, as he chose where he would live and what he would do, he was not guided and governed by the good of his own soul. He was guided and governed by the lust of the flesh, the lusts of the eye, and the pride of life. He was careless for the good of his own soul. And he should not, and he did not, expect or receive God's blessing upon him. This should really govern our choice. The principle that what is best for us, which is best for our souls. When you choose what is best for your soul, it will be best for you. Think not of your own material welfare. Think of the welfare of your soul. Think not, what is going to make me the most money? Think about what is going to be spiritually beneficial to me. Because when we choose for the advantage of our souls, every other good thing comes to us. But if we are careless of our souls, we cannot expect God to prosper us, especially spiritually speaking. That is best for us, which is best for our souls. And Lot's career is a very sad and disappointing career. Abraham has a much different life. Abraham chose communion with God. This is really the thing that was most important to Abram throughout his whole life. His fellowship with God. His relationship with God. Everywhere we see Abram going, what is he doing? He's building altars. And what does that mean? It means that he wants to draw near to God and worship God, but he knows that he cannot come to God without a sacrifice. Altars are built for sacrifice. And sacrifice means the shedding of blood. And without the shedding of blood, there can be no remission of sins. 
And so Abram builds altars so that blood might be shed, so that his sins might be remitted, so that he can have fellowship and communion with God. Even though Abram was a very wealthy man, and by all accounts, a very successful man, the thing that mattered most to him was his relationship to God. Abram in this world had no certain dwelling place. As we read through the whole story of Abram in Genesis, we see him moving here, there, and everywhere. And even in this chapter, he's in Egypt, he goes to the Negev. And then as he's in the Negev, he goes to Bethel, the place where he had formerly pitched his tent and built an altar. And then at the end, we see him traveling to Hebron and building an altar and pitching his tent there. Abram was an alien and a stranger. He was a wanderer on earth. He had no settled place because he knew this world was not his home. He was searching for that city with foundations. He was looking to that land where righteousness dwells. He was always seeking a better country, a heavenly country, because he knew his citizenship was not primarily on earth, but his citizenship was in heaven with God. Abraham was also in a position to assist his nephew Lot in a time of crisis. And here again, we see the choices that are made in times of crisis do a lot to reveal the character and to determine the career. So going back to Genesis 14, when Cater Leomar and the kings of the east had taken over and kidnapped Lot and his family, Abraham has a choice. Is he going to let Lot just suffer and disappear? Or will he go with his 300 trained men and attack this great army in an attempt to rescue Lot? And we know from Genesis 14 that Abraham went after Cater Leomar. He attacked him by night. He conquered and he rescued Lot. And so the godly who live by faith are always looking to serve others. Abraham was not a selfish man, but he was a servant even of his foolish nephew. Well then finally, what are the results of their choices? What are the outcomes of the choices these two men made? And here is where the contrast is most stark and clear. First of all, Lot, because of his choices, Lot lost his influence. When the angels came and told Lot what was about to happen in Sodom, Lot went to his sons-in-law and he told them, it is time for us to get out of here. God's judgment is coming. And you remember what those sons-in-law did? They laughed at their father-in-law. They thought he was jesting. Because of his compromises, Lot forfeited his influence. And when we make foolish and ungodly choices, we can very quickly squander whatever influence we have garnered over our years of life. Lot could barely convince his wife and his two daughters, but it seems that his sons also did not listen to their father because they did not respect him. Not only did Lot lose his influence, Lot lost his goods. Everything was left behind in Sodom. He and his wife and his two daughters escaped with the clothes on their back. Apparently, Lot had significant goods, and leaving those goods was very difficult for his wife. So much so that it brought about her end as she looked back yearningly and longingly at all they had left behind. 
Now, Lot, when he moved into that area, was already a wealthy man. He would apparently continue to have growth in his flocks and herds, and he loses it all because of his sinful and wicked choices. Lot also lost his wife and most of his family. His wife looked over her shoulder. She was turned into a pillar of salt. He lost his wife. But he lost most of his family too, his sons and his sons-in-law. And if his sons had married, his daughters-in-law. Some have speculated that there may have been 10 people connected with Lot's family through his wife, his sons, his daughters, and their spouses. And most of that family was consumed in the fire and brimstone that fell upon Sodom. Even those who were saved were a curse to Lot. His wife Though she left physically, her heart was still connected to Sodom and the old life they had enjoyed. What a grief for a husband to see his wife immediately judged by God. And when Jesus says, remember Lot's wife, it is a testimony to how chilling and how stunning that must have been and what a curse it was to Lot to see his wife turned into a pillar of salt. And then there are his daughters. His daughters who went with him, but were not a comfort and a joy to him. In fact, they led him into incest. And they were a curse to him. As Lot was being dragged out of Sodom, Lot shows his character because he was still bound to have his own way. Turn to Genesis 19, verses 17 through 22. We see this here. When they had brought them outside... One of the angels said, Escape for your life. Do not look behind you and do not stay anywhere in the valley. Escape to the mountains or you will be swept away. But Lot said to them, Oh no, my lords. Now behold, your, your servant has found favor in your sight and you have magnified your loving kindness which you have shown me by saving my life. But I cannot escape to the mountains for the disaster will overtake me and I will die. Now behold, this town is near enough to flee to, and it is, a, it is small. Please let me escape there. Is it not small that my life may be saved? He said to him, Behold, I grant you this request also not to overthrow the town of which you have spoken. Hurry, escape there, for I cannot do anything until you arrive there. Therefore the name of the town was called Zoar. Now, if you were being whisked out of town by angels and they were saying, flee to the mountains, would you say, oh, no, <laughs> oh, no. Let me go to this little town of Zoar. You see, even though Lot had been rescued, he was still rebellious and he was still willful. You would think at this point, after losing everything he had lost, he would be humbled. But he's not humbled. He's still proud and haughty in his heart, so much so that he will argue with angels, which is never a safe or sound policy. And so it seems that as we look at the results of his choices, that Lot had moved into Sodom and Sodom soon moved into Lot. The place where he was living began to deeply impact his own heart and life and commitment. In Lot's story, we have to look at his end. We never hear anything more of him 
after that sordid scene with his daughters in the mountains. And in that scene, Lot engages in the sin of drunkenness. Now let me be clear. Alcohol is not inherently evil. We don't believe that. God created alcohol and used properly, it can be a good thing. Take, for instance, the Lord's Supper. But when a person engages in the sin of drunkenness, that is a very serious thing which has detrimental effects. Drunkenness makes men forgetful, and it also makes them forgotten. Many a name which otherwise might be remembered with honor and respect is buried in contempt and oblivion because of perpetual drunkenness. And so the end of Lot is a very sad end, to be sure. But the end of Abraham, the result of his choices, is much better. This is what we should strive for. Abraham was a man of influence. He had such influence that he could even barter with God about the number required for the destruction of Sodom. That scene between Abram and God where he is saying, but if you find only 40, what about 30? What about 20? What about 10? That's a remarkable scene. Abraham had influence with the Lord because Abram was a man of God. Abraham also exhibits constant faith in God. He is the believer. He is the man of faith. And as you review the life, the story of Abraham, you see a man who is living by faith in God every step of his journey. Not that he didn't make some mistakes, not that he didn't have occasional stumblings, but he was a man who had faith in God. He also lived a life of separation unto God. He was given over to God to serve God. He knew that friendship with the world was hatred toward God. He wanted nothing to do with the men of Sodom. So when he came back with Lot and the goods that they had recovered from Cater Laomer and the king of Sodom wanted to give him a gift, Abram said, I don't even want a single thong of your sandal. I don't want anything to do with you. Now he was very happy to engage with Melchizedek, but he wanted nothing to do with that wicked king of Sodom because he was separated unto God. He also enjoyed communion with God. And that communion seems to go richer and fuller throughout his life. Abram's life was one of obedience to God. And so as he grows in his relationship, that growing relationship with God produces the fruit of obedience and good works in his life. As we look at Abraham's wife and family, they are altogether honorable. Sarah is a paragon, a woman held up for imitation. And his family, Isaac and Jacob and the patriarchs, they are all honorable, godly people. And his death and his end are so much different from what Lot experiences. One last passage, Genesis 25, verses 7 through 11. These are all the years of Abraham's life that he lived, 175 years. Abraham breathed his last and died in a ripe old age, an old man and satisfied with life. And he was gathered to his people. Then his sons Isaac and Ishmael buried him in the cave of Machpelah in the field of Ephron, the son of Zohar the Hittite, facing Mamre, the field which Abraham purchased from the sons of Heth. There Abraham was buried with Sarah his wife, 
It came about after the death of Abraham that God blessed his son Isaac, and Isaac lived by Beer Lahai Roy. This is a noble death. A man who dies, whose body is laid to rest in honor by his sons, Isaac and Ishmael. A man who is remembered down through the ages with great respect and honor. And so as we've seen these two men and their lives contrasted, what is the lesson for us? If we are justified by faith, if we are in a right relationship with God, then we need to live lives of faith. We need to live unto the Lord in all of our ways. We need to seek after and enjoy communion with God. We need to give our lives as sacrifices of obedience and praise. And as we do, we will find the Lord blessing us even as he blessed Abraham. But if we make the kinds of choices that Lot made in moments of crisis ourselves, can we really expect anything more than what Lot received? And so each of us come to crossroads, and there are two ways. Are we going to go the way of God, the way revealed in his word, the way of righteousness, holiness, obedience, trust? Or are we going to live for our own advantage in this present world? Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for this challenge from your word. We thank you for the truth that we have seen. And Lord, we do thank you for the many times that Reverend Perkins preached this same message and the fruit that came from his preaching. May much good fruit come from it tonight and through our ministry on the internet, may it come in many hearts and lives in the days and years to come. We pray it in Jesus' name, amen.